Let's take a look at something, exploration. Who are the great seafaring nations of the past? Just name two. Spain, Portugal, England, okay. Let's ask where English comes from. English language comes from the United Kingdom. Okay? They had a name. Hail Britannia, Britannia rules the seas. Okay? The sun never set on the British Empire. By the way, for that to be true, <laughs> the sun also never rises on the British Empire, right? That's, people forget that, that you can't just get it one way. Tell me. So, who in the world has English as their official spoken language? Every one of these countries has English as an official spoken language. Okay. Let's look at the French. French had a navy too. In fact, my middle name comes from one of the French admirals, Admiral de Grasse. We are told as Americans that some ragtag Minutemen with musket rifles defeated the most powerful military force the world had ever seen. And we believe that. <laughs> the French are always looking for a fight with the British. We were very good diplomatic ties with the French through Jefferson and through, through um, uh, Ben Franklin. And so we said, hey, you guys want looking for a good fight? They said, sure. And they sent their navy to blockade the ports, preventing the British from bringing in supplies, personnel, and material that they would have used to totally kick our butts. Okay. <laughs> That's what ha actually happened back then. That's left out of the history. So the French, let's see who speak French in the world. Okay? French had a navy. They got around. They conquered. Uh, how about Arabic? Arabic, there's a whole period of time uh, where they, they, the Arabs were like huge explorers. All these countries speak Arabic. Not as many as the others. These sort of land explorers more than ocean. How about the Spanish? That came up in the list. Let's see who speaks Spanish. There you go. I count Puerto Rico here. It's not a separate country, but it's we'll count it. It's a separate municipality. Hmm. How about Italy? Italy, this is interesting. I'm trying to think about this one. A Columbus was Italian. But Italy didn't pay for his voyage. Spain paid for his voyage. Now, every year there's the Columbus Day Parade in New York. And everyone marches down 8th Avenue and gathers at the Columbus Circle statue. Every time that happens, and all the Italian American community shows up for that. I feel like climbing up the statue, pulling out a megaphone and saying, go home! Italy had nothing to do with this man. You didn't pay for his voyage. You didn't care. He asked you for money. You declined it. You were busy building cathedrals. Spain was bent on world domination, so Spain wrote the check for Columbus. And so now let's look at all the countries in the world who speak Italian. None. <laughs> Other than, actually, that's not true. Uh, Vatican City speaks Italian. <laughs> San Marino and the Ticino, two little bitty countries in the, in the Alps, I think. That's it. That's it. This is kind of interesting. Those countries that were explorers, be it militarily driven or otherwise, had the greatest influence on who speaks what language in the world. They got basically naming rights. Italy did not. That's how that played out. Let's look at international. <clears throat> this is a quick slide here. It's, it's, you can't read it, but let me just say, there are things we did here in America. Just want to understand this. Just keep this clear. All right? And by the way, what's going on here at the, at the nuclear facility, it is, it is exactly the, 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 
what, what, what enables it is the international dimension of what that facility is. Take a look at this. The country primarily responsible for radar is England, but subsequent leadership from the United States. Fine. For breaking the German code in the Second World War is England, using English scientists, mathematicians, and engineers. Fine. Country primarily for the Manhattan Project, it's America. Our money. But let's look at the intellectual capital that enabled the construction of the bomb. These, you can add or subtract from this list, but it won't make much of a difference. All these people, physicists, either worked directly on the bomb or invented science that was used for the bomb. Let's look where they were born. Only two were born in the United States. Only one got his PhD in the United States. Everybody else is a foreign national. Everybody else. There would not have been a Manhattan Project were it not for foreign scientists. Country responsible for landing men on the moon. Of course, America. Our money. How did we do it? We captured Werner von Braun from Germany. <laughs> he wasn't at the Nuremberg trials, was he? <laughs> this man invented the V-2 rocket, the first ballistic missile. Terrorized London. He did not go to Nuremberg. We said, you're coming with us. And by the way, bring some of your, your, your rocket engineers with you. We put that man in Huntsville, Alabama. Talk about the culture shock. <laughs> okay. That was culture shock. Huntsville, Alabama, the seat of the civil rights movement. Okay, you got like the bombing churches and the thing, and we got German, like Nazi, <laughs> building the Saturn V rocket, taking America to the moon. If, is that just crazy? <laughs> but in fact, that's what happened. By the way, that investment of NASA in that area created a burgeoning technological educational community in the middle of Alabama. <laughs> You go there, you, you have no clue you're in out, you think you're in, in the future. Because to build that rocket required support of industries and structures and smart people and their kids to have, want to go to good schools so they built better schools and they had better services and the arts and there's a thing. It all rose up around that center, which was otherwise in the middle of nowhere. So the value of international participation in your enterprise is significant. You can close off your borders, but then you shrivel. 